So, uh, so hey everyone, uh, happy Friday. You're here on the Gitcoin live stream. It is May 1st and today we're gonna be uh, talking with um, Alex, uh, the co-founder of Near Protocol. So next week they're running Ready Layer One, uh, which is kind of like a virtual summit with a bunch of educational se sessions and workshops. Uh, and then they're gonna be running a virtual hackathon for seven days after the fact. So uh, really excited to dive into this and, and to get things started. So um, Alex, yeah, if you, if you don't mind, do you want to tell us just a little bit about um, about yourself, your background, you know, the, the start of Near Protocol and kind of, you know, what you guys are building? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Alex. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Near. Uh, before before Near, I was working at a company called MemSQL. It's a sharded database. Uh, I joined MemSQL as the first engineer when it was three people and a Pomeranian in the two-bedroom apartment in Menlo Park. And when I left, it was a 150-people company with the deployments at Goldman Sachs, Uber, uh, Pinterest, and like a lot of other Fortune 500 companies. And uh, after MemSQL, uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I went through YC uh, with the company, which uh, later through a couple pivots became near protocol uh, with uh, my co-founder Ilya. Uh, we were initially doing some machine learning stuff. Ilya is coming from TensorFlow background. He was one of the developers of TensorFlow at Google. Uh, but ultimately, we pivoted to uh, to blockchain primarily for the reason that uh, back in like uh, summer of 2018, uh, we were looking at we were looking to host something in blockchain. We didn't want to build a blockchain, and we were exploring on which blockchain to run. And uh, effectively, Ethereum was the only viable option, uh, and it was uh, pretty pretty hard and pretty slow. And so we looked at all the papers, and there was already a lot of uh, protocols which were uh, being built. Uh, and we were not convinced at that point that uh, we would build it in any of those ways, right? And uh, given that Ilya was building TensorFlow, which is system software, I was building system software for five years at MemSQL and I was working at Microsoft before, uh, we brought uh, a lot of our friends. And, and coincidentally, quite a few of our friends also with very good system background were in between things. So uh, my uh, one of our core engineers, Eugene, he just left Facebook because he was fed up with, uh, with the uh, with the big company, and so like we, we we grew to nine people in the matter of three days, and all of the nine people were uh, tier one uh, system software engineers. Uh, three people from MSQL, many people from Google, uh, and, uh, and and that team allowed us to grow very quickly. We very quickly managed to raise uh, a little bit of funding, not like crazy uh, ICO money, but more than enough to survive initially, and then uh, we raised a couple times after that. Uh, and uh, what we concentrate in near is, is one thing is, is obviously scalability. We want, we want it to be uh, sufficiently fast so that people can actually run some usable uh, applications. Uh, so that, uh, so one thing is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty fast in terms of block production times. So it takes, it produces blocks every second, finalizes every three seconds. And uh, in between, uh, before the three seconds even, uh, even happen, uh, it brings a block to a state which we call uh, Sort of practical practical finality where uh, uh, if the block gets reverted, that means at least one uh, one one block producer was slashed, uh, which is way way weaker than BFT finality, which happens after three seconds, but more than sufficient in practice. And in practice, it can be a difference between like one and a half seconds and three seconds, which from user perspective is actually very noticeable, right? If you click a button, uh, mm -hmm. one and a half seconds feels significantly better than three seconds. Uh, but our bigger Effort. Our bigger uh, emphasis is uh, we we put a lot of effort into making it very usable and very developer friendly. Uh, so uh, so uh, if you talk to people and we, we like we went to a lot of blockchain companies, a lot of blockchain users, and we talked to them why what, what are their big pain points? Speed was one, but the bigger point was always the fact that uh, the onboarding of users is very hard. Uh, and uh, so some early projects we talked to they report between ninety five and ninety seven percent drop off rate from the landing page where people land from some advertisement or some other way until they actually get uh, to use the project, right? And, and that uh, includes uh, a, a lot of people uh, fall off when, when you ask them to install MetaMask, uh, even more when you ask them to sign the first transaction if they don't have Ether, that's effectively immediately losing a customer because you really need to be very appealing to the user for the user to go to Coinbase, send their passport, you know, wait for five days, get their tokens, actually invest some money uh, before they can try, try a product. All right, so in here, we're trying to remove all those hurdles. Uh, and I will show a quick presentation uh, if I'm allowed to share, which I'm not. Yeah, one second. We, you should be good, actually, if you click share screen. We've made you a co-host, Alex. Share screen. 
host disabled participant. One participant can share. Now it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let's see. Uh, I think Connor, you may have to try to uncode yes. and try it again. You are. Right, you should be able to share now. Maybe yep, now I can. Cool. Perfect. Okay, let me just share my entire browser. Hopefully, there's nothing compromising me there. No private keys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my MetaMask is there. Can can you get my key from the MetaMask icon? I hope not. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so I already went through what near is, uh, and <clears throat> uh, and so the second aspect of it is developer experience. I think developer experience is somewhat less crucial, right? If uh, if your platform is, is is needed, people will learn how to build on it. So, for example, you know, Objective C is probably one of the worst languages existing, and yet when when iPhone was was trending, people were building on it, and yet good developer tools uh, are making it significantly uh, easier for people. To build, uh, and so uh, in our case, uh, first of all, uh, usually you would not be building in Solidity. We do we do support EVM running on uh, on Near, so you can build in Solidity if you want to, especially if you want interoperability with Ethereum. But if you're building native Near application, you would usually either use TypeScript or Rust or anything else that compiles to Wasm. But TypeScript and Rust they, they cover a pretty wide uh, set of skills, right? So TypeScript is almost indistinguishable from JavaScript, uh, and so. If a person comes from front end or like full stack background, that's a great choice. And Rust is, uh, I guess, it's like one of the fastest growing languages uh, of 20, uh, 19, 2020. Uh, we have very nice web ID with one click deployments. I will show it in a second, but that allows you to start building a near very quickly with the very little setup. Uh, and also, most importantly, uh, applic application that is deployed on near. The user can start using it without actually having near tokens or any extensions uh, uh, using this uh, thing we call hosted wallets. It's effectively a wallet which is controlled by a centralized entity, which pays for all the gas costs. Uh, and what enables that is a slightly different security model. So in Ethereum, the, the account is the key, right? And so if if you started using a hosted wallet which is centralized and that hosted wallet in some way had access to your key, your account is permanently uh, compromised. Right, you have no idea if that hosted wallet at any point was malicious and, and collected your key. Uh, and in uh, in near account is, is defined by account name and the key can change. Right, and so if you started using using a hosted wallet, uh, and then after some time you realize that you actually have some assets in your account now which have value, and so you don't want uh, you don't want to risk it. You can at any point mm -hmm. actually install the the proper plugin, uh, create a proper key locally, and change the key on your account. And this is the very last moment you have to trust the hosted wallet. Right, so you just need to trust them one last time to change the key. Once that happened, you have full control over your account. You don't need to trust anyone else, and you know for sure it is not compromised. Uh, and finally, uh, for uh, uh, one of the big advantages of Ethereum uh, is that it's very composable. However, if you build a component for others to use, it's very hard to monetize it, right? Because you need to not only build the actual component that others will link against, you also need uh, some way for them to, to be able to pay for it. Uh, so in near it's slightly different. In near part of the transaction fees and rewards automatically is distributed among all the contracts invoked, right? And so if you have a contract which is a component of a bigger system, if someone builds on top of you for as long as people use you uh, sufficiently frequently, you will be getting uh, you will be getting uh, royalties for that. And so let me quickly show you the experience uh, of uh, uh, of uh, building the first application in near. So if you go to near.dev. Uh, it will it will open a page with a bunch of examples. Uh, half of them are written in assembly script. Assembly script is the TypeScript which compiles to Wasm. Uh, half of them are written in in, uh, in Rust. Uh, so I will just use the very first example. Uh, and when you open an example, you can either go to GitHub or Gitpod. And so Gitpod is this incredible tool, which launches in the browser. Uh, let, let me open the one I already have, but you can create it. You will get exactly the same experience, uh, which launches a fu a fully functional instance of Visual Studio Code. In your browser, uh, and effectively, you can immediately start experimenting with it, right? So it opens you uh, the entirety of the of this example, which includes both the backend. So TS is TypeScript; it's the it's the actual contract uh, which contains the uh, uh, the uh, the guestbook. Well, it's a very small contract, right? You can add the message, you can get messages, mm -hmm. uh, and it contains the front end. In SRC, uh, you will see the 
uh, the actual HTML file JavaScript. So this is the entirety of the front end. And so when you deploy it, uh, so in my case, uh, it's Firefox prevented it. When you deploy it, what it does is it deploys the backend, the contract to the testnet of near, and it deploys front end to GitHub pages. Uh, and so you get the fully functional application in a single click, right? So I have the book awesome. already working, right? And so if I play here in Git pod, uh, and then I click, well, I actually don't remember what I need to click to run it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, well, I definitely can start debugging it. <clears throat> sure. But if you use Visual Studio Code, uh, it should be, we, we just change it from a different tool to, uh, to Git pod. So I'm not the, the very best presenter after that. Before before we just had the run button, but it's it's very trivial to run it. I think I think if you just change it and, and refresh here, that that will definitely work. So let's let's as an experiment just try that, right? So for as long as you don't close the page, you're definitely good. <laughs> uh, where's the title? Title near guest book near guest book. That's that's a good edit right there. <laughs> near awesome guest book. Let's try to refresh it. Well, no, you need to redeploy it in some way. Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a slightly failed demo. No, no worries. This this is really cool. I haven't used Gitpod before. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, Gitpod is great, uh, whether or not it is used uh, to build uh, on near. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a pity I cannot I cannot properly demonstrate the redeployment. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, uh, good. But uh, all, all of that, all of that will be available uh, as a as a documentation when the hackathon starts. Cool. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the experience when I'm already logged in. Uh, but imagine, so so first of all, this this URL uh, it's a little long. Uh, but uh, if you if you open it in another browser, which uh, well I'm not sharing the other browser. <laughs> let me let me switch to uh, to my private window. Mm -hmm. Where is Zoom? Oh, my Zoom is gone. Uh, new share. Give me one second. Yeah, sure. Okay, share screen. Okay, do you guys see the, the second tab? Uh, we see, yep, near guestbook messages with Alex that near saying yes. hi. Uh, first of all, actually, redeployment worked. I just didn't realize what I changed. I changed the title, right? If you look at the title of the page, I don't know if the title is actually shared. Yeah, but it actually does say, say near oh, awesome yeah. book, right? Yeah, I, I see it up there. Yeah. Okay. So, so it actually does work, right? If you change anything and just refresh the page, uh, it picks it up. Uh, I'm not sure if the contract will automatically be redeployed, but definitely the front end uh, gets deployed mm -hmm. to uh, to GitHub pages. And so I'm logged out. Uh, and so this is the brand new experience, right? I just opened it in private private window. There is no plugin for near installed. If I press login uh, and uh, I, I choose some username, alexnew.testnet, uh, and create the account. Uh, so it creates an account. And so this is a centralized wallet that is hosted on near, uh, and uh, it covers all the gas costs. Uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 it has some account recovery. So the goal, the goal effectively is for users, which are not blockchain users, to be able to use those applications, right? So they will not understand any of the uh, private uh, public key initially. So the, the hosted wallet is designed in a way that is already familiar to them. They can choose email recovery, phone recovery. I will just use recovery phrase, uh, which is a more uh, hardcore blockchain way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Set up recovery phrase. I need to save it somewhere. Um, okay, cool. And then when I continue, it says what is worth number nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, now. Uh, and so now we have the account. <clears throat> uh, I grant permission for the guestbook to use it, uh, and it's ready to be used, right? And so the first time this onboarding, it takes a couple steps, but now every single near application can use the same account, right? So every every next uh, uh, touch with any other near application will be uh, will be significantly more streamlined. Uh, cool, so this yeah. example, it, it 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 shows not only like the basic interaction with messages, it also allows you to send money. So I can send one near from my account if I have it. Uh, so it is test net. Yeah. And so is that is that central entity basically like sponsoring the equivalent of gas cost? Yes. So, so like... the, yeah. So so on the test net, okay, something got broken. 
Uh, so on the testnet, it's uh, uh, it uh, it covers all the gas costs for everybody. On the main net, uh, initially we're going to be probably doing the same, uh, but over time the the actual economic uh, incentives here are the following. For us, there is a huge incentive to cover gas costs because we need adoption of near, right? So definitely up to some limit we will be covering costs for everybody. But also if you actually build your own application, you have your you also have an incentive to cover gas costs for your users because if the user can uh, if a user doesn't drop off early interacting with your application, it is more likely that they will in the future can convert to paying customers, right? Whatever is your actual monetization in the future. And so you can host your own hosted wallet through which people will be coming uh, to your application uh, and cover gas cost for them up to some extent, or if if people match certain conditions, if they uh, uh, totally. with, some, with, cer with certain uh, stable resistance, which you will need to figure out as a developer yourself. Uh, but then uh, once you do that, uh, it's, it should significantly decrease the uh, the barrier of entry for uh, people who are not in crypto today uh, to uh, mm. to start using it. Okay, so let me reshare my initial screen. I don't know if it's still shared. Uh, yeah, we have the we we, are, we still see the guest guest book. Book. Yeah. Okay. So let me start sharing again the original screen. Cool. Um, and then, so while you're doing that, so wait, um, this might be um, a dumb question, but is your mainnet actually live yet, or is that happening? right? So, so this is interesting. We we consider it to be live. Uh, it is not very widely advertised. Uh, mm. It's probably going to be more live in in a week. Uh, but however, this mainnet, uh, it's it might be an abusive term depending on how on how far are you on the crypto maximalist scene. So what what we define as the mainnet uh, is the chain on which the state will not be reset. Right, so, uh, so for example, if you launch an application and that application has users onboarded, uh, those users who onboarded their state, ten years from now it's going to be the same state, right? So usually, if there's a test not deployed today and mainnet is planned in three months, uh, the the state will be reset, right? They will reset the state. However, in our case, the genesis has already been created; it is launched, uh, and that and that network is live. Uh, that network today is operated entirely by us, uh, and so there are multiple phases in the future. So the second phase. Uh, is when we're going to invite external validators to run it. So the external validators only uh, operate on the testnet. Uh, and then there is a phase three uh, when we're going to unlock, or rather they call phase zero, phase one, phase two. It's, it's zero based, right? So phase zero is today. We run it ourselves, and you cannot transfer near, right? So if you have near, you cannot move it. You can only pay for gas. Phase one, external validators will join. Uh, they're already uh, testing everything. So initially, it's going to be professional validators, people who already have near tokens from private sales or from uh, from participating in incentivized testnet. Uh, and then phase two is uh, token transfers will be unlocked. And so the launch of phase two will happen through the community vote. So it's not going to be us deciding, OK, guys, now we can do transfers. It's going to be community who will say, who, who will look at the network, uh, assess stability their perspective, and decide, OK, now we're ready to. And it's going to happen through token vote, most likely. Uh, yeah, so that's the idea. However, if you want to deploy application and then have users already using it, uh, you can do that. You can uh, you will just need tokens to pay for gas of your users. Something we can we can provide on our end. Uh, yeah, awesome, cool. Uh, and so also there's an explorer. Uh, so if you go to explorernearprotocol.com, uh, it runs for every uh, network. So there's a drop down in the right. Uh, well, I guess I can just open it. So you can see all the transactions. Uh, we don't have uh, too many transactions happening. Uh, so there's testnet, uh, there's uh, devnet, and betanet. Uh, so testnet is uh, so betanet is actually what is being run by external validators. So betanet, if you go to betanet, you will see there's uh, 33 nodes online right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had an upgrade a couple of days ago, so not everybody upgraded the binary. So some of them uh, uh, dropped off. <clears throat> cool. Uh, and the and, difference uh, between the beta net and the dev net? Uh, so dev net is, is like the bleeding edge, right? So okay. it's, it's the latest and greatest. Beta net is a stable version, which is run by external validators. Uh, test net is, uh, is where you would deploy applications today, uh, which is also our centralized, uh, where you would rather experiment with your applications. Sure. So we run it locally. Uh, and uh, so, so right now, in case there is still some instability and it can go down with external validators to play with your applications, it makes sense to run it on a centralized. Right. So, so by default, if you go to Git pod and deploy, it will go to, to testnet. Cool. Uh, so a couple words about the protocol. Uh, well, we already talked about usability. I showed uh, how it works. Uh, 
so, so if you're interested in, uh, in blockchain research, uh, then you can go to near.ai slash nightshade. Uh, it's our sharding design near sharded blockchain. Uh, or you can go to near.ai slash doomslug. Uh, it's not on the page. It's our consensus, which is, uh, it is, it is not very different in many aspects from Tendermint. Uh, so for example, it takes approximately the same amount of messages, number of messages exchanged to, to finalize a block. But those like has two nice properties. One, it is significantly simpler and simplicity is very important in, in uh, when you build uh, uh, critical sort of software which, which cannot go down. The simpler it is, the less likely it is that, that, that you mess something up. Uh, and the second right. property is that in Doomslag, so Tendermint and Doomslag, they both take like two full, um, uh, two full uh, rounds of communication between everybody to finalize a block. And as I said at the beginning, uh, in Dooms, like after the first round of communication, uh, the block is already reversible unless at least someone is slashed, which in practice is often more than sufficient for most of the practical use cases. And so you can you can effectively get a uh, faster time to meaningful finality and your application will be performing. Uh, the, the, the experience from the user will be significantly better because uh, the, the delay is less. The finality is quicker, yep, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, when it comes to sharding, each shard uh, today pulls off approximately 200 TPS. Uh, we didn't spend too much time optimizing single shard experience, so maybe this number will increase in the future. Uh, primarily, this number 200 TPS comes from the fact that uh, the blocks are every second, not every 14 seconds. So if you multiply Ethereum performance by 14, you will approximately get 200, right? So it's... Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the main net that is running right now, it only has one shard. Uh, because one shard is more stable than many shards, and we just want to get more time uh, to test multiple shards. But the test net, uh, or like if you if you fork the code and run it, you can run multiple shards. And obviously, every, everything is open source, and uh, uh, all the communication, all the code. Cool. Got it. Got it. So yeah. Uh, one question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Please, please. No, go go ahead. Yeah, the one question on the scalability. Uh, I know we may get into this in the hackathon prizes, prizes because I. I've gotten to take a sneak peek. I know there's one around Ethereum operability, interoperability. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, is that something that you guys are are working through at the sharded layer, or is that something done somewhere else in terms of like a, the way that uh, technologically you are you're hoping to do that implementation? So, so it's it's interesting. So, um, there are two parts of the Ethereum interoperability interoperability one of them is uh, you can actually we, we, you can deploy evm as a smart contract on near so evm parity evm is a is a rust evm uh, ethereum virtual machine you can compile it to wasm and deploy it as a smart contract and so now you have evm running on near that's what we do we uh we have suma james presswich uh, who built it for us very cool uh, uh, and so from this perspective if you have an ethereum contract you can deploy it however there is a there is a big caveat here that in sharded system you cannot have easily synchronous calls between contracts, uh, because shards operate independently, right? And so if you if you want from one smart contract on one shard to call another smart contract on another shard, that happens asynchronously, and so TypeScript and Rust they both uh, on their own have very good APIs for asynchronous calls. They have promises, they have futures, right? So you can, uh, and so the way you would write the code, you would say call this other contract. Uh, and that will give you a promise. And then on the promise, you can say dot then and do something else. And behind the scenes, our runtime will split it into three parts. It will split into everything before the, the call. It will execute it on one shard, schedule uh, the second call on the other shard. And then once that is done, it will schedule back the second part on the, on the first shard. So as a developer, you don't think about it. You just build asynchronous code and you don't care at all that it is sharded, uh, but it is asynchronous. While in EVM, if you build in Solidity, all the calls are synchronous. Right, which makes it which uh, effectively makes it very hard to do it cross short. Uh, so even in databases world, synchronous cross short transactions are active area of research, and there is nothing very good that works. Uh, mm -hmm. So the way we do it today is every EVM instance on every shard is independent. So if you, you can have synchronous calls in EVM within shard, but you cannot have it uh, cross short. Right, while uh, for the native for the native contracts, you can you can have arbitrary cross short calls. Uh, and the second part is we have a bridge with Ethereum. So on Ethereum, you can uh, uh, on Ethereum, Ethereum maintains a light client of of Near, uh, and Near maintains light client of Ethereum on chain, right? So therefore, you can you can you can make arbitrary claims about state because both Ethereum and Near maintain a Merkle state root. So if you have a light client, you know the latest block of the chain, you can easily 
prove any claim. And so on top of that, you can build arbitrary transfers. Uh, and so, for example, uh, I believe we have today uh, a way to transfer DAI, for example, from, uh, from Ethereum to NIR, right? And so that allows you, uh, because Ethereum is already has a huge eco ecosystem of, of, a, of, of a variety of assets, right? So we don't want to bootstrap it from scratch at NIR. It doesn't make any sense. We just have a bridge. And so if you have some assets on, on Ethereum, you can bring them to NIR, use them, right? So for example, uh, we have one inch exchange building on NIR, other exchange, we have flex market building prediction markets. You can bring DAI or any other asset from Ethereum, use uh, applications on NIR, then you can bring it back if you uh, if, if you need it again. Yeah, interesting. That's super cool. Yeah, wow. yeah. Thank you for giving that deeper introduction of like, you know, the two different pieces of the bridge because it's helpful to think about it from both perspectives. Yeah. And they work together well in the sense that if you have application on Ethereum, it is already written in Solidity. Uh, it makes sense to deploy that very application on near also uh, on the VM. So that's very little development cost. And then you just modify it slightly to actually have the interoperability uh, so that it can uh, talk through the, through the bridge, right? Through so bridge. It, it simplifies significantly uh, the uh, if, if someone actually wants to be deployed on both chains. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I did not know that. So it's very good to know. Yeah. Maybe there'll be some cool uh, cross-chain stuff happening in the hackathon. Because I know, Hopefully. obviously, our yeah. our, uh, our community is, you know, very uh, Ethereum. Ethereum yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and so I didn't talk at all about regular one, right? I, I hope you guys all heard about it. I, I, I hope our yeah. marketing works and uh, people actually are aware <laughs> of what's happening. But if it is not, uh, you can go to regular one, and there is no P, it's not player, it's layer. Uh, and uh, it's a conference uh, organized by practically all prominent layer ones today. Uh, maybe maybe like there's a couple missing. So Celo, Solana, uh, Polka.Cosmos, Near, uh, Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we, we all participate. I probably missed someone. Uh, Vitalik is speaking. Uh, Gavin Wood is speaking. Uh, Brave CEO. I don't, don't remember his name. He's also speaking. So there's, uh, there's an epic lineup of speakers, a lot of workshops. It's very practical, very hands-on. We try to remove all the shilling. I'm sure some shilling will will get through. That's it's blockchain space, but we try to make it very technical, very to the point. Uh, yeah, uh, and yeah. Uh, you can apply at layer one and participate. And so the hackathon will follow it. And there's a lot of workshops at the, especially on the last day of, of layer one. We actually have uh, workshops dedicated to prepare people for the uh, for the hackathon. Amazing. Yeah. Really awesome. Yeah. Speaker list. And yeah, I was gonna say I believe we still have some tickets left from our the, the Gitcoin link you sent us. So I'll drop that in chat for anyone who doesn't have a ticket yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, and the big emphasis of that conference is that uh, collaboration is be is better than competition, right? So we're all technically competitors. I, I like to compare it with Hunger Games. Uh, before before we can start competing, we need to actually make people uh, aware of the uh, of the benefits of crypto. I actually, get on board it and we can do significantly more working together, right? So we, we're not an Ethereum killer. We actually do want to work with Ethereum as closely as possible. And historically, we've been working with Ethereum very closely, both on research and, uh, and some other efforts. Uh, and we're not trying to kill Ethereum ecosystem. We want to integrate as deeply as possible and provide whatever near can provide on top, right? Better usability, better DevX. Uh, but Ethereum still has all the assets. Ethereum still has all the attention. Uh, and uh, there are different considerations on proof of work security and proof of stake security. Right, so for certain use cases, you will you will prefer to uh, to be uh, Ethereum native, and then only use uh, near as a uh, through the bridge as a front end. Yeah, cool. Definitely. Yeah, so that yeah. covers my my talk. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, well, so just I guess on the conference, so I, I would like to dive into the hackathon too, and maybe you know go over some of the, some of the bounties you guys have put together and give a little a little sneak peek, but. Um, so on the conference, you you named like some of the other companies that are joining. Um, Cosmos was one of them, and so I'm curious, um, you know, what's like near protocols relationship with Cosmos? Are, are you guys like you know using IBC or going to be like connecting um, your your chains as well? Um, or I don't know. I guess I just like to learn more about that relationship because we've been doing some work with Cosmos lately. Yeah. So we're not using IBC today. Uh, near supports. So in terms of interoperability, what NIR supports is we, so we have a bridge with Ethereum, uh, which, which is not ABC based. Uh, and we have uh, interoperability between shards, which is more uh, native to the protocol. So it also does not uh, use ABC. Uh, specifically near uh, for the interoperability, one thing we, we optimized for is that 
uh, cross chart transactions they take time to to to, to jump between charts, and so we we needed uh, we need we wanted to have the time uh, from one hop to another to be exactly one block, and so uh, we designed like the entire protocol is revolving around this this requirement, and so it would be very hard to use ABC for that. Uh, however, in the future, uh, as Cosmos evolves, most likely near will will support ABC just as a, as a single zone, right? So that you can easily communicate between near and other zones, right? So that's probably going to be just deployed on near side to support it. It's probably going to be just a smart contract on the chain, which will provide whatever is necessary. Uh, and so that that way you will be able to bring assets from near to any other zone or from any other zone to near. Uh, same uh, with Polkadot, it's harder to say because uh, it's not as easy. Like everyone can run a zone, but if you want to have a part of chain, there is limited supply. So whether near will ever be integrated as deeply into Polkadot ecosystem, uh, that is not uh, as clear. Cool. Yeah. Got it. Um, yeah. I mean, so if anyone has any questions, you, you some of you might not be able to unmute, but you can either drop them in the chat or you can request to be unmuted, and and we're happy to uh, let you chime in. But um, yeah, if there's no other questions right now, I'd, I'd love to dive a bit more into the, the hackathon and prizes you guys are putting up, if, if you're cool with that, Alex. Yep, let me see. I, I have a question for you, Alex. <laughs> um, I guess I, I, the question that I have is like maybe less technical in nature, but it's about your vision for your protocol. So in five or 10 years, it's 2020 right now. So let's say 2025 or 2030, wh what would you like to see the near ecosystem look like? Um, yeah, that, you know, what kind of use cases, what, what do you want to see out of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so from perspective of the use cases or, or like more general mission of NIR, uh, we are more excited, at least I'm more excited, uh, and I know many people at NIR are more excited, I will not speak for everybody, about the open web narrative than, uh, uh, than DeFi narrative, though DeFi is still a, a very big use case. I think open web, uh, if it actually takes off, DeFi will be a big part uh, of, uh, of that. Uh, initiative. Uh, and when I say sp say open web, I don't mean that, like applications specifically running on blockchain. I just in general mean community owned applications where uh, users, uh, where effectively there is no centralized profit seeking entity which controls the application, which controls the usage of data, which controls attention of users, which controls mm -hmm. uh, the decision making of, of, of what to change, what to deploy, what, uh, et cetera. Uh, and blockchain is a big part of it uh, because, first of all, for that, for that narrative to take off, uh, there, there are got to be meaningful ways to monetize open web applications. Uh, and so uh, that, that actually involves very simple, uh, both money transfers or like paying, paying for some, uh, for some uh, functionality where I think blockchain is miles ahead of everything else that exists. Uh, ho however, there's still quite a, quite a long way to go. Uh, blockchain is also necessary for, uh, for orchestration. So, so while I don't believe those applications will run on, on blockchain per se, even one and a half second is completely unacceptable for most of the actual interactions you have with the uh, Web2 applications today, right? Uh, but I believe that management of who is actually hosting them, who is running them, uh, and some disputes, they will all uh, be, be resorting to blockchain at the, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, and also identity uh, and, and some other uh, use cases. So I think blockchain will be at the very core of open web narrative. And so five to 10 years from now, I hope to see more and more uh, Core applications we use on a daily basis, uh, being on the on the uh, own way community and not by profit seeking entities. So I think I hope Near will be at the forefront of that movement, uh, but we will yeah. see. I, I have a quick follow up question, which is just something of interest for me. Is like, let's imagine that that's true that we have one of these community owned um, applications that we use, and uh, and it's it's a common thing that everyone everyone's. Uh, in their daily life is using. Why Why is that going to be better? Um, like, why is that going to better align incentives? How might that mean that the experience on a community-based application uh, is going to be better than a uh, an application built by a profit-seeking profit entity? Right, so I'm not 100% I'm not certain that the experience will be better. I think for those, for those applications to take off, people will have to figure out 10x better experience because you cannot, you cannot, you cannot win over uh, by, by having the, the functional parity. You always need to be significantly better. I, I don't think that 10x improvement will come from the fact that it's built on blockchain. People will actually have to figure out how to build 10x better product. Uh, and I hope, I hope that will be happening. 
I, th I think where community owned becomes important is uh, is more in uh, uh, if we do not switch to community owned model. I, ha I have this uh, personal sort of uh, idea that I called. Uh, so, so effectively, the way I see it is that the world is sort of moving towards uh, being an episode of Black Mirror, where Google, Facebook, and others they have so much attention of a user and so much data about users that they can they can influence our decisions in such a subtle way we will have no idea that happened, right? So you know, if, if Facebook and Google collectively today want to like sway the results of an election, they have a lot of power, right? I think I think they can like easily sway it five ten percent in some direction but by by doing very subtle things by like changing a little bit the results in the in the search. Or like slightly changing the, the actual narrative, like, like that, that I see when I go to the to the to the Facebook feed, right? So from this perspective, I think having full transparency into how the backend actually operates, what sort of models run it, right? So 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 having the backend open, having clear insight into how my data is being used, that is very important to prevent that from happening, because uh, uh, like even today they have a lot of power and they. Uh, they, they they hold monopoly today, right? So I don't think anything will change in the next five, 10 years unless someone someone goes and builds infrastructure uh, and and drives the uh, the actual movement of building applications uh, th that are owned by community. So if nothing changes, I, th I think uh, like you know both both Google and Facebook back in the day they they wanted to be good, right? But uh, they you know Google literally dropped "Don't be evil" from their from their narrative. So I, I don't think Facebook and Google will very quickly become community owned. Those are very complex. Google is very complex to build, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Facebook, you 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 will have to, you will have to, it's very hard to to get the mode to to take sufficient number of people. But some other applications will will go first, right? Uh, something simpler, something that is not as global. And I think hopefully over time, uh, the community will be able to overtake the the core applications as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was very well put. So, um, so yeah, so the prizes are hidden from the main prize explorer mm -hmm. right now. Um, however, if you click, go to the town square tab, um, mm -hmm. you should be able to, yeah. So you see, you can see how you oh, posted nice. them. Um, and so, yeah, little, little trick for, for any of you hackers on the call. Um, technically the hack that's not live yet, but, um, you can get a sneak peek. So I don't know if you want to click into any of these or just kind of talk about them at a high level, yeah. but I'd love to just know a little bit more, you know, like what, what's your goal with this hackathon? You know, what are you, are you just trying to, uh, educate people or you know build new products and tools that that are going to get you know used in the long term um yeah right. anything else you can say so excluding ethereum interoperability hack uh all others of these four uh they we, we try to come up with some challenges which are relevant to the modern world uh and uh if you see what's happening especially given all the lockdowns uh big problems are uh, people don't have social interaction and for some people who are more introverted, which actually in our community, there's a lot of such people, uh, they can handle it well, but society as a whole actually handles it very poorly, right? And uh, I know many people who bear, who, who like, they, they they go crazy. Uh, so we have social interaction hack. We want to see what people can come up with uh, that can uh, that can somehow improve social interactions between people. Uh, similar accessibility hack, uh, it's uh, uh, people, uh, in the current outbreak, the most vulnerable people are elderly people. So they are, they're going to be locked in their houses for way longer than everybody else, I think, uh, in the in the coming month, right? So if you can come, if someone can come up with a great application, which will help them in some way, uh, uh, that would be something that they, they themselves can use or, or, or using uh, someone uh, who's, ne uh, who's near them. That's, that's something that would be very relevant in the modern, in the modern world. Uh, yeah. So in, in in case of financial hack, I think it's more of the, uh, it, it's it's more common uh, topic in the blockchain space. Uh, but right now, especially, it becomes a big, uh, it becomes a bigger problem for many people, right? So a lot of people are unemployed, a lot of people lost their job or or like uh, lost a large percentage of their income. So can we come up with some interesting financial hacks which which will be able to uh, maybe mitigate this problem in some way? Uh, or or delay the the consequences of it. Uh, so I think in the in the present situation, uh, some, maybe there is some there are some DeFi ideas which would be even more applicable today than they were several months ago. Uh, finally, global hack is uh, uh, it's it's effectively no no track at all. 
uh, you know, the best application you can build, the best ideas people can, can come up with that, that can affect the most number of people in the world today, uh, that will win the, the global hack challenge. Uh, there are several challenges which are not posted yet. Uh, we have a student hack, uh, which is effectively, instead of judging the, the awesomeness of the applications, we will judge uh, the effort put into building it. Uh, so if, if, if someone is a junior developer who joins this hackathon, uh, if they learn through using uh, developer tools, uh, through, uh, through the experience of building on blockchain, uh, and they build something cool, we'll be judging primarily from, from the perspective of, uh, of what they learned, of what they put together, of how, of how uh, interesting it is, it is from the technological perspective. Mm -hmm. oh, I love and that there, idea. That's yeah, uh, and there are going to be two more challenges from, uh, from two companies that build in near. Uh, there's a gaming marketplace called Stardust, and there's a prediction market called Flux. Uh, so we're going to post two challenges from them. Uh, if, so if people want to integrate with them, if people want to see how composability actually works in action on near, uh, there are also two more prizes uh, which are not posted yet. I love it. And and so with like so, so some of those bounties, it sounds like it might you might be allowed to kind of put one project and apply to multiple bounties. Is that uh, is that going to be okay with yes. you guys? Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Uh, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to only win one prize. You can win multiple. Right, so for example, student hack uh, obviously works with everything else. Uh, financial hack could also be very, very well Ethereum interoperability uh, hack, and obviously glo global uh, glo global price uh, works well with everything else. <clears throat> cool, yep. cool, and and what was I going to say? So I, I do, I just love how all these hackathons that we've uh, that we're running. Um, you know, somehow still uh, like put in this, this social, you know, public health aspect to it. Um, and even if that's not like the main focus, it seems like every hackathon has that as like a theme or has some bounties around it, which, which I really like to see. And um, I think a lot of people on the Gitcoin platform have been excited about, you know, technology solutions for uh, this, this pandemic and, and things around it. And so uh, I'm excited for those bounties specifically. Yep. Awesome. And I, can you remind me what currency are you planning to pay out the prizes in? Uh, it's going to be Dai, most likely. Okay, cool. cool. And we talked a bit earlier about the Ethereum um, interoperability prize. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that one. Yeah, is a, it's most of already. Little, yeah, cool. So it's more technical than others. So all the all the remaining uh, hacks, they they more. Uh, purpose-driven, uh, this one is more technological, uh, but obviously it, it works well with every uh, purpose-driven uh, price. Yep. Yep. It's also cool. more advanced in the sense that it requires both understanding how near works, but also have uh, uh, good uh, familiarity with Ethereum, which I think uh, for Gitcoin audiences. Sense. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alex, for the presentation first on near and then getting into Ready Layer One and then the hackathon. We're excited for the launch uh, just a week away uh, for the hackathon and for Ready Layer One, even less than that. Starts on May 4th, so three days from today. So uh, the free tickets are in the chat for the Gitcoiners who have been uh, on the call. Feel free to pick those up. I think 1,700 registrants was the last I saw. So I think marketing has been going pretty well, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and yeah, really Fox, uh, really, really good list of people. Um, I'm looking at the landing page. So thanks, thanks, Alex, for joining to, to tell us about Thank it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. And for anyone watching on YouTube, I do think we have the link to the tickets in the YouTube description. So um, feel free to grab some of those. I know there's a limited amount. Uh, but yeah, really excited for this uh, next week. And yeah, can't wait for the hackathon as well. So thank you uh, so much for joining. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for coming, Alex. Bye.